So today we're going to be discussing fiat. Raise your hand if you're completely unfamiliar with that term. Yeah. Alright, so y'all at least heard the term fiat at some point before. Somebody want to take a shot at defining it? So y'all all heard of it, but none of you could. Isn't it like, like some kind of, uh, well, I literally at least said it's like something like fate, not like, like in the real world. It's like just let it be. Like, okay, so fiat means let it be. It's fake and not in the real world. If something like isn't likely to happen, just assume it's happened and like talk back from there. Yeah, so it seems like y'all sort of, you got the, the base concept. Fiat uh, is Latin for let it be. It shows up in other contexts. It's like uh, if you ever heard of fiat currency, um, you know, the U.S. dollar is a fiat currency, which means it's not attached to anything. It's not like a certain amount of U.S. dollar bills equals a certain amount of gold. It's just the U.S. government says this is the amount of money, and then everyone just assumes that's the correct amount of money that the dollar is worth. And it's really only backed by the U.S.'s promise that it's worth that much. So in fiat and debate, uh, usually refers to advocacies, so the affirmative advocacy, the negative advocacy, and when they say let it be, or when they say fiat, what they're saying is we can just assume that that advocacy happens for the purposes of the debate. Because, you know, imagine the affirmative stands up and says, we should do a universal basic income. And the negative gets up and rejoins by saying, that's just not going to happen. They might be right, they might be wrong. Universal basic income seems kind of unlikely right now, you know, given our current Congress and all. But is that really a good response? Would that be a fruitful debate? For the negative to just say, no, nah, that's not going to happen. I, I don't think it's likely. Rather than debating the merits of it. Probably not. And so that's the basic idea of fiat, which is the affirmative gets to say, well, I'm arguing in favor of universal basic income. Whether it's likely to happen or not, I'm saying that it should happen. And so we should debate from there. You don't just get to say, no, it's not going to happen. And I'd see, I, the way I primarily see this explained, I think is actually a little bit misleading. A lot of people explain it like this, which is, well, it would be really hard on the app. You know, the app would never win if they always had to prove not just that their app is a good idea, but also that it's definitely going to happen. And the neg would just have this knockdown argument against like 95% of affirmatives. Because most topics are really controversial. Most topics aren't about to get passed. You know, universal basic income seems really, really unlikely to pass in the next few years. Um, likewise, the previous topics, global ban on nuclear power, the, you know, the previous September, October topic, Stuff like that seems pretty unlikely. And so the app would be at a, a huge disadvantage because the negative would have this knockdown argument. And so a lot of people say fiat is a sort of like debate construct we have to protect the affirmative from that argument. And I think that's a little bit misleading. I would phrase it like this. Supposing you were debating in a, just not in a debate round, just you're debating somebody else on the streets and you're trying to make an argument for something, say the basic income. And you're like, hey, I think this is a good idea. And they walk up to you and they're like, that's not going to happen. Have they disproven your argument that it's a good idea? You don't think they have? No, it seems like, it seems like they made a pretty bad argument. You said we should do this, and they're like, yeah, but we're not gonna. They haven't really responded to you in a meaningful sense. So, and so I think, I think something important to recognize is that fiat isn't something that only applies in debate rounds. It's, just, it's a term we only use in debate rounds, because you know jargon, much like many other terms we use. But the logic of fiat would apply in any debate, in any context. Because if you're just shooting the breeze with somebody, and you're making an argument for the universal basic income, it's still true that they couldn't accurately respond to that, but it's proving that it's not going to happen. Likewise, like if I just took a knife out right now and just started stabbing Brandon repeatedly, and he's like, resolve, Jacob, Jacob, you shouldn't stab me. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not going to stop, sorry. <laughs> now, I haven't really proven that it's okay. It might be true that there's nothing in the world that would make me stop stabbing Brandon, but obviously that's not the same thing as it being right, or that I should do it. And so it just, it's correct for any debate topic where we're debating what we should or what we ought to do, which shows up in like 90% of topics. But the question is not, is it going to happen or not? The question is, should it happen or not? And so the point of fiat is just a term that debate has that represents that underlying logical fact, which is just that you can't disprove that or you wouldn't be effectively disproving that by showing that it's not going to happen. And so that's the basic idea of why the affirmative gets fiat, which is that the negative objection of not going to happen just isn't an actual response to a topic about what we should do, or a topic about what we ought to do, which is pretty much all the topics. Everyone follow that? You know, raise your hand if you have any questions. All right. And then, I guess, kind of on a related note, what about the negative? Does the negative get fiat? Anyone want to raise your hand and give an opinion on that? The negative already is the status quo. Uh, okay, so the negative is the status quo, so they don't have to change anything, they don't have to advocate anything. So what, what if the affirmative said, well, you know, you, you like the status quo and all, but the answer is definitely going to happen. Sorry, we're definitely going to change from the status quo. Is that a good affirmative argument? 
Okay, you're not liking that one either. Um, any other opinions on negative fiat? What if the negative decides not to defend the status quo? What if they think that F is a bad idea? Not because the status quo is really good, but because it's a better option. Maybe they don't like the universal basic income because they would like expanded welfare programs, or maybe they would like uh, you know, living wages or something to that effect. Can they fiat that? Anybody? You want to take a guess? Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> maybe. Will the judge let you? <laughs> yeah, I guess ultimately it boils down to what the, what the judge will let you do in any case. If the judge thinks the sky's red, you probably want to assume the sky's red for the purpose of the debate. But more realistically, um, the, the same logic applies to the negative because I, I guess a little bit more indirectly. The, the negative doesn't have a resolution the same way the affirmative does. You know, the affirmative is defending a statement like the United States should do UBI uh, or the United States should, you know, insert any policy whatsoever, or even sometimes not just the United States, like the, the September-October topic was about countries in general should ban nuclear power. And so the affirmative has a particular stance on a particular action that they think should happen to change from the status quo, but the negative doesn't have a resolution. And so um, every once in a while someone will make an argument about, you know, there's no negative fiat because there's no negative resolution. There's nothing that justifies the negative advocating a change. The fiat has a resolution, but the negative doesn't have that. And I think that slightly misconstrues the function of what the negative is doing if they're proposing advocacy in the debate round. When the negative proposes an advocacy, maybe it's the status quo. They can advocate for doing nothing, just status quo is hunky-dory right now, don't change anything. Or they can advocate for something that's not the resolution. You know, they can advocate for doing some other program to solve income inequality or poverty if they're debating against universal basic income. If they're arguing against that, say, the nuclear power affirmative on that last topic, they can argue for some other form of energy, maybe like you know, solar or wind maybe. Um, and what they're doing there is they're not is inserting a new resolution into the debate round. They're trying to show an alternative to what the affirmative is doing. So if the affirmative is saying, let's do a ban on nuclear power, and they're saying, well, let's increase nuclear power via, say, a different type of nuclear reactor than we currently have, they're showing an alternative to what the affirmative is suggesting. Likewise, if they say, uh, instead of universal basic income, let's impose a living wage requirement on any you know, employer, then that's an alternative. And so anyone heard the term of opportunity cost? You should think of any negative advocacy as an opportunity cost to the affirmative advocacy. The negative couldn't just like pick their favorite advocacy and be like, this one's mine now, we debate between the two, and which one's better? And without any relation to the resolution whatsoever, because then the negative really would always win. Just pick your favorite policy, imagine any policy at all, just pick the best one, and you're like, well, the app might be good, but mine's even better, I got the best policy there is. Well, that'd be kind of a shallow and superficial debate, I don't know. What's the best policy? If you could think of one policy that you would really, really want to pass, that's the ideal policy, what would it be? Government shouldn't murder people. For no reason. All right, just never murder people. It's probably a good policy. I think we already have a law against murder, but it should definitely exist. It's a good one. Anyone else? Nobody has any conception of what policy you would want. Don't run for president. I'm just kidding. Y'all can all run for president. But uh, point being, debate topics in general are meant to be controversial. You know, the affirmative uh, and the negative are both defensible sides, and so rarely is like. Any debate topic can be like the ideal, obviously good topic because they're meant to be something you could argue on both sides. And so imagine the negative could just pick any advocacy whatsoever and be like, this is the best advocacy with no constraints on it at all. Then they're always going to beat out what the affirmative is because the app is constrained to one particular controversial topic. Neg picks just some obviously good non controversial topic and then there's like, mine's better, I win. So the purpose of the negative is not to introduce a new you know, resolution in a sense. If they say, I'm defending living wages or I'm defending solar power, or whatever the negative advocacy is, that's not the new focus of the debate round. You shouldn't think of it like that. Even if the negative has another advocacy or a counter plan in the debate round, the affirmative is still the focus of the debate round. You're still debating the resolution uh, or the affirmative advocacy. And so you should think of the counter plan as an opportunity cost to the affirmative advocacy. If anyone's unfamiliar with the term opportunity cost, that means it's a cost, not in terms of like dollar value or human lives or happiness or something else. But the cost of the affirmative is that we miss out on the opportunity to do something else. You'll hear this concept in economics if you ever take economics. It's not just a debate term. And so when you're establishing a counterplan, it's just like any other case, any other disadvantage. You're just saying, well, the, the problem with the app is if we do it, we can't do this other thing that's even better. And that's why there's an additional burden on the negative when they introduce an advocacy that the app doesn't have, which is that they have to prove... Anybody? Negative. Competition? Yeah, competition. Uh, 
The negative, if they introduce an advocacy, has the burden of competition, i.e. competition with the affirmative advocacy. That these two things in some way butt heads. Because if the act gets up and says, we should do a universal basic income, and the negative gets up and says, let's do my favorite policy, don't murder people ever, what's, gonna, what's the act going to say? They're going to say, well, yeah, but we could do both of those. There's no reason why that's competitive with the affirmative advocacy. You're right that not murdering people is good, but I'm also right that the universal basic income is good. So even though the negative has proven their advocacy, they haven't known what the negative really needs to do, which is disprove the affirmative advocacy. If both the ass and the negative are good ideas, the ass is going to win. Because the ass burden is proved the ass is a good idea. The negative burden is not proved that the negative has got a good idea, it's proved the ass is a bad idea. So if you're introducing an advocacy, you have to go one step further on the negative and say, well, the, the reason why this is relevant, the reason why me proving my advocacy is a good idea, is important to the debate round, is because it in some way trades off with the affirmative advocacy. Not, it's not just true that the living wage is a good idea, but we should do that instead of a universal basic income. And so then the negative is not only just a good idea, but a reason why the app is bad. And the reason the app is bad is because we'd miss out on the opportunity to do that thing from the negative. And so that's the function of the negative's role as you know, improving the advocacy in the debate round. And then here, you know, that same logic of fiat still applies. You know, imagine, um, you know, same example. I'm still stabbing Brandon. And then Brandon proves that I, I shouldn't stab him by offering an alternative. He's like, well, what if instead of stabbing me, you know, you took a walk and just uh, walked your anger off? I'd be like, yeah, but I'm not gonna. Still not a good argument, you know? I'm like, resolved, I should stab Brandon. I'm the F now. And Brandon's the one on the negative. You gotta disprove that I should stab him. And, well, it doesn't matter if uh, there's a better option. I just wanna stab him. You know, same logic applies, which is, if the negative is trying to show, much like the F, what we should do or what we shouldn't do, then you can't just disprove a counterplan by saying, that's not gonna happen. Because maybe it is the best option. Maybe we should be doing the counterplan instead, and whatever the negative's advocacy is. And so the F, likewise, still has to deal with that. They still have to say, that's not a better option. Everybody follow that so far? Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, another concept that I think uh, shows up pretty relatedly uh, is what's the scope of what the negative can and can't advocate? And there's a lot of questions relevant to that, and we can't cover all of them in this lecture. Um, but briefly, I think one thing to consider is uh, what's the nature of a counterplan, and how does that relate to which counterplans are legitimate? If a counterplan is an opportunity cost to the affirmative, then the legitimacy of a counterplan is going to depend on whether or not it trades off with the affirmative in some way. And so if you think about the nature of competition, and I was going to write something on the chalkboard, but I realized I'd give it away my chalk. Um, if you think about the nature of competition, it means the negative counterplan has to be in some way different from the affirmative, and it has to be something that we could do at the same time as the affirmative. Either because it's literally impossible to do the affirmative and the, the counterplan at the same time, or it's because it's undesirable to do both at the same time. And so that's the general constraint uh, on the negative counterplan. It's also got to be a possible option. Um, as an example here, this is a, a little bit of a brief detour, but um, Here's an example that shows up a lot in philosophical literature. Uh, you'll see it if you, you know, research utilitarianism, probably. Um, I'm going to use it for completely different purposes, um, unrelated to its initial use. I just happen to like the example. Supposing you're walking down uh, a road, and you pass a pool of water, and you see a baby drowning in it. And you're deciding, well, should I save that baby drowning? And you're like, well, I could save the child's life, but I got a nice suit on. And I want to ruin my suit. I have to get a dry clean. That would cost me a lot of money. I have to spend like 20, 30 bucks at a dry cleaner. Should you still save the baby's life? Raise your hand if yes. It worries me how slow those hands are going up. Raise your hand if no. Okay, those, <laughs> you almost look like you're raising your hand there. Sorry, everyone would, everyone would save the baby, right? So uh, in that scenario, it seems kind of obvious, yes, you should do that. Um, and so what if, um, I don't know, Kavya's walking down the road, she sees the baby drowning, and you're trying to convince her. You're like, hey, Kavya, you should save the child. And she's like, no, nah, I'm not going to. You know, what's the problem with that? It's not showing whether or not she should. Right, exactly. You know, in this sense, you're, you're making an argument about what she should do, so you can sort of see at it, like, well, imagine you were to do that, consider whether it would be better or worse. And she can't disprove that by saying, no, nah, I'm not gonna. You know, maybe you know, she's not gonna listen to you, but that doesn't make you wrong. So she wouldn't have disproven your claim that she should save the child. And now, imagine, though, that she offers a counterplan. She's like, well, counterplan, what if instead of like jumping in to save the child, I like get out my trusty pool net that I carry with me everywhere and just scoop it out? God, you never leave someone without a pool net, right? Now that might be a good argument. You know, at, at, 
she might have negated your statement there. You, I shouldn't do what you suggested. I shouldn't jump in the pool. That would ruin my suit. I should pull out my pool net and do it instead because that's better. And so now she has just proven your claim that she should jump in the water to save the child because she offered a better alternative. But here's an interesting case. Let's say there's a lifeguard. Uh, who haven't referenced yet? Lifeguard Katie. And we know that lifeguard Katie uh, is probably better than Kavi at saving the child. She's had lifeguard training. Um, she's not in an expensive suit. So it would be better if Katie saved the child's life. And so Kavi's like, well, I'm not going to jump in because it would be better if Katie did it instead. And so that's what she tells you. She says, I'm not going to jump in because Katie should save the child instead. Is that a good argument? Anybody? Yeah. All right, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're convinced. You don't want to have to jump in. You ruin your suit. <laughs> All right, what if I told you this? Katie, uh, although she's very qualified, really, really does not want to save that child's life. You know that Katie uh, is just completely uninterested in doing her job. She'd much rather sit on top of the lifeguard stand and play Pokemon. And the last 20 times there was a baby in that pool and was drowning, she just sat there and did nothing. So you know that although Katie is perfectly qualified to save the child's life, She'd much rather just watch the child drown in her binoculars and uh, pull out her Nintendo DS and play Pokemon. Would you save the child's life? Yeah, that sounds like a reasonable thing to do. All right. So in this, well, we'll get caveat. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> so, so in this case, even though Katie theoretically would be better, you'd be like, all right, well, she's not doing anything. Even if it would be ideal that she did something, I'm going to jump in. But why doesn't that same logic apply? Why can't Kavya say, well... I just fear that Katie saves the child's life. Why isn't that a convincing argument? In the same way that all these other counterpoint arguments seem to make sense. Anybody have an answer? Yeah, so uh, I think you, you get a lot of people who are, who are staunch advocates of uh, what we call agent counterplans. This is an example of an agent counterplan, which is someone proposing a different agent should to take the same action. And uh, I think it's a you know, pretty severe logical problem with them that they, you run against a good conception of fiat. And I think this example demonstrates why, which is the function of a negative counterplan is to be an opportunity cost. You have to say, here's this other thing you could do that you're missing out on. And the reason the negative is counterplans, the reason they logically make sense as an argument in a debate round, outside of a debate round, as long as you're arguing, is because they're still proving the apple's a bad idea. And they're proving the apple's a bad idea because they're saying, the reason you shouldn't do something is because there's something else better that you should do. And the problem with this counterplan of, well, just Katie saves the child is, that's never an opportunity for Kavi in the first place. You know, one way a counterplan could run aground is the counterplan could be something that you could do either way. You could, you know, do a ban on murder whether or not you pass the universal basic income. And so the, the opportunity cost might not exist because there's no cost. You never lost that opportunity. But the flip side could also be true. The counterplan might not be an opportunity cost because it's never a true opportunity at all. You know, imagine Kavi was like, why don't I just sprinkle my magic no, no drowning dust over the pool so the baby doesn't drown, right? Well, the answer is that's not a real thing. You can't do that. And so that's not a counterplan because it was not an opportunity available. And so likewise, I think you have to consider what are the actual scoop of opportunities available to the person that you're talking about or the government that you're talking about. And the reason this counterplan doesn't sound persuasive in the way that all the other ones we're discussing, at least not in an intuitive sense when we're just putting in an example, is because if we're discussing what Kavi should do to save the child, well then, even if Katie would ideally save the child, that's not something Kavi has control over. And you can think of similar examples that actually would make more sense. Like imagine, you know, that the one thing, Ka uh, not Kavi, the one thing Katie loves more than Pokemon is money. And so Kavi is like, hmm, I can just bribe Katie to save the child. It would cost me $30 to get my suit dry clean. What if I just give her 10 to get her to jump in. That might make sense as an argument. If you have, if you have a good reason to believe that you know, Katie could and would save the child if you just gave her $10, then may, maybe the best option is just to pay the lifeguard to save the child rather than jumping in yourself. But now no, it's no longer really an agent counterplan. You're not saying, I see out that Katie does something. You're saying, well, here's an option that I could do that's available to me. I could try to bribe Katie to get her to save the child. And so now you're really discussing another option available to you, and that becomes a reasonable argument. Likewise, Maybe you think Katie is really likely to save the child, and so you think, well, I'm going to do nothing because I know, I know that Katie's actually really, really trustworthy. This time is going to be different. Katie's going to save the child this time. Well, now you might have a good argument again, if you have good evidence for that. But now you're not really seeing anything. You're sort of, you're predicting it. You're saying, I do think this is likely to happen, 
But now that burden of showing that it's likely exists again. You've got to show it's going to happen. And so you can't just say, well, let it be so. Katie will save the child and expect it to happen, right? Because the opportunities to you are the things that you can do. They're not the things every other agent in the world is going to do. For the purposes of the United States federal government, they have to consider what are the things that we could pass. They can't consider, like, what are the things that we could, like, make the government of China pass. Like, kind of a trivial, obvious example, what if you have a topic about North Korea, like, sanction North Korea to prevent its um, development of nuclear weapons? And the negative is like, counter plan, what if North Korea just instituted multi-party democracy? Problem solved, right? <laughs> it would be a really easy counter plan to win. Uh, problem with the logic is, obviously the United States federal government has no control over the North Korean government and can't just choose to have North Korea institute multi-party democracy. And so that's an example of an agent counter plan that might show up in a debate round that would be really terrible because they're obviously doing something that is outside of the control of the United States government. And so I think, uh, this sort of line of well, reasoning is the reason why I think agent counterpoints are a bit silly. Um, how much time do we have left? Other fiat-related questions. So, one term that shows up uh, somewhat frequently, anyone heard the terms pre-fiat or post-fiat? Some people? Yes, I think this is a little bit of a misnomer, um, but it's a useful concept to understand. Um, usually, pre-fiat, um, people are trying to refer to arguments about like within the debate round itself, or arguments um, not per se about the resolution. And then post fiat refers to arguments about whether the resolution is good or bad. And it's slightly misleading because it's not like there's like a time like we're, we're we're going along and all of a sudden fiat happens and then the resolution is in place and then like there's a post fiat point of time and a pre fiat point of time. Um, but an argument that would be post fiat would be something like you know universal basic income is a good idea because it reduces income inequality. Or a negative argument that's supposed to be out would be universal basic income is a bad idea because it would be better to have a negative income tax, something like that. And so those are arguments about the resolution. They're about the thing that we're discussing um, fiatting or passing. And so if the resolution is about banning nuclear power, if the resolution is about free speech on college campus, if the resolution is about um, any of the other recent topics, um, qualified immunity for police officers, universal basic income, then the post-fiat debate is the debate about whether that's a good idea. Is the resolution right or wrong? But not everything in a debate round is about that. You have arguments, say, theory arguments are pre-fiat arguments in the sense that people use that jargon because they're not arguments about whether we should do universal basic income. If, if your argument is, my opponent did something unfair, they ripped up my flows and that made it harder for me to debate, <laughs> then you're not proving the resolution's right or wrong. You're introducing an argument about within the debate round itself. And so people call that pre-fiat in the sense that it's not about that thing that we're discussing fiatting, it's about the, the debate itself um, prior to fiat. Um, a lot of critique arguments are pre-fiat in the sense that they're about the debate round or the, the discourse in the round, something to that effect, and not necessarily about whether the app has a good advocacy or not. And so that's usually what people will refer to when they refer to pre-fiat and post-fiat, is, is it about that thing, the resolution, that we are fiatting or assuming is going to happen for the purpose of the debate round. You know, unclear on that. All right, perfect. Another related concept uh, that you'll hear often in fiat is durable fiat. I think uh, a lot of what we discussed up to now has just been sort of a a basic understanding of like how debate functions, and it's not something that shows up in rounds proper a lot. It's more just trying to understand like the function of what people mean when they say other things like counterplans and competition and so on. Um, but some of these are terms that you actually might hear somewhat often in debate rounds. You know, pre-fiat and post-fiat people will say, durable fiat people will say. And so this is when we get to like the actual arguments you might end up developing. So durable fiat, um, anyone want to take a chance and try to define it? So durable fiat is the assumption that not only can we assume the app is going to happen, but that it's going to just stay in place. Because, you know, without durable fiat, you might get some really silly scenarios. Uh, imagine the current conservative Congress passes a really liberal bill like the universal basic income, what would realistically happen? They'd be like, wait, why do we just do that? We hate universal basic income, and then they would undo it again. You know? So if we, if all we assumed was that just right when the ballot is signed, the plan passes, and nothing else about the world changes, no affirmative would ever solve anything, because there's some reason why it hasn't happened yet, and that reason would also cause it to get rolled back or undone. And so if we couldn't assume that not only does the um, universal basic income get passed, but goes into effect and stays into effect, we'd have really silly debates where we just say, oh, well, it passed, but it's going to be gone tomorrow, so it doesn't do anything. Or in that previous example, 
goes, I pull out my knife for a third time, start stabbing Brandon again, because I know I got a new objection, and Brandon pulls out his old, don't stab me, Jacob. And this time I go, yeah, but if I stop stabbing you, I just start again. You know? Doesn't make that a good argument. Doesn't make it okay to stab Brandon, even if it was true that where I just stopped stabbing him, I would start stabbing him again. And so that's the concept of durable fiat. And this shows up sometimes. A lot of times, negative will try to get tricky and say, say you know, the affirmative doesn't solve their own advantages because the thing that they're doing is just going to get undone by some other reason. You know, they'll introduce an argument about politics and say the app is really politically unpopular and that has bad consequences. And then they'll throw in there also if it's politically unpopular, like people won't enforce it or won't undo it and stuff like that. And so the affirmative answer, uh, usually the, all you're going to need to say against that is, yeah, but the affirmative gets durable fiat. I get to assume that it's going to happen. You, your argument is no different than just saying app wouldn't happen in the first place, which isn't a good argument. So saying that's going to get undone doesn't prove that we shouldn't do it. And do it in the sense of like actually put it into place and maintain it and enforce it. Uh, and so durable fiat is the idea that the app gets to be like legitimately passed and implemented, not just passed and then we go back to do what we were doing before. Anyone unclear on that? Yeah. So then, if the neg, like, on this topic, like, argue that, oh, the possibility that uh, Congress passes a UBI, like, is very minimal and, like, will automatically be undone. Mm -hmm. So then the app could just say, oh, why can't we just, like, durable fiat? Like, right. So the app says, you might be right. The universal basic income is unlikely to happen. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. You know, even if it was true that the current Congress would not do it or would undo anything that looked like a UBI, that doesn't mean they should be doing that. We're not debating what the Congress is going to do. We're debating what the Congress ought to do. And so in a case like that, the correct answer is we're, your argument just doesn't disprove the resolution because the resolution is not about what's going to happen. It's about what should happen in the same way that just fiat in general makes sense. Yeah. And I think most judges have a pretty low threshold for this to the point that like, if the negative says the plan is not going to get done or the plan is going to get rolled back and you just say, yeah, but the app gets durable fiat, that is honestly probably enough of an argument because everyone I think kind of accepts it. like obviously that is true. It would be terrible if every app just immediately got rolled back. And so you usually don't need to go into too much more depth on that than the app. And those arguments from the negative usually win if the app just like misses them. There's some, I guess, slightly more borderline questions. You know, suppose the negative starts implementing, uh, or not implementing, introducing arguments about enforcement. Uh, exactly how much does the app get to assume about the plan being enforced? They probably get to assume that the government is at least going to like make a good faith attempt to do something to enforce the law, but maybe the, the negative argument is something like, well, they're not going to do it very effectively, or they're going to do it in the sort of like most minimal sense, because like many of the agency of the, gov agency of the government are still relatively conservative, and we're not going to, you know, like, maybe the IRS isn't going to do too much to actually collect the taxes to pay for the UBI, or it's otherwise just going to be ineffectively implemented. Maybe you could say we can assume that that, you know, isn't a relevant consideration, we should assume that they like do their best, or maybe you say actually that sort of like bureaucratic, you know, um, inefficiency is actually a relevant part of the topic and is something you really need to prove we could overcome. And so some of those borderline questions might exist, like exactly how much the app gets to assume, and then you might need to debate it out. But just in general, if the negative was like, yeah, Congress would just undo the bill, then I think just saying the word durable fiat is probably enough of a response for most judges. Other questions? That's a good question. All right. Um, another question relevant to, to fiat, who's heard of the politics disadvantage? All right. Anyone think of a, a fiat-related, you know, issue uh, related to the politics disadvantage, or why it might be relevant? So uh, a lot of people, you know, debating the politics disadvantage. Um, there's a, a very common debate about like what it means to affirm the resolution, and it the politics disadvantage, disadvantage really hinges on a particular interpretation of what that means. Because supposing this were true, that affirming the resolution just meant like the bill passed instantly. We just like assume that the bill were in effect. That that was how the act came into place. We were just like, you know, tomorrow we wake up and there's a universal basic income. That would probably be pretty bad for the politics disadvantage in the sense that the the way in which those political trade-offs happen is over the process of the debating and actually getting the bill passed. The negative argument is usually gonna be something to the effect of, well, if tomorrow we decided to have universal basic income, that means people in Congress are need, going to need to debate it, and then maybe the president's going to need to push forward or at least sign off on the bill, and then it's going to go into effect, and the Supreme Court's not going to overrule it. And that whole process costs a ton of political effort, political capital, et cetera. You know, um, maybe the Democrats have to lobby hard for that, and one part of that is going to be, you know, giving concessions to the other party. And then maybe the disadvantage is going to be something like that, which is that in order to get the affirmative passed, 
the whatever you know side of the, the political aisle is passing it has to give up something else, and that something else is more important. That's a pretty common argument. You know, a few years back, universal health care or immigration reform, something like that. They'd say, well, Obama could pass this, but if he does that, it's going to screw up his efforts to get immigration reform done, or it's going to screw up his efforts to get the Affordable Health Care Act done back before that was passed. Um, nowadays, it might look like something like, well, if it was a conservative bill, then it's going to undo Trump's ability to like, get his tax cuts passed, and those are important for the economy, something like that. Uh, there's other versions, too, like when there's an election coming up, uh, a very common argument would be like, this can swing the election one way or the other. But probably a really common one is something like, the political process of getting the bill passed is going to undermine our ability to get something else passed. And I'm sure there's going to be lectures here about politics disadvantages, and I'll cover it in more depth. So that's just the Spartanist version. But uh, in general, the politics disadvantage is often going to hinge on exactly what it means to affirm the resolution. What it means when we, when we say we can just assume that the resolution is going to happen. So... Um, Anyone, I guess, you know, want to share your opinion? What, what does it mean if you say U.S. should implement a universal basic income or provide a universal basic income? Does that mean, you know, right now the Congress should pass the bill? Does that mean something different than that? Does it mean we assume that bill exists? Does it mean some third option? I would assume that it would just mean that Congress should pass it as it would any other bill. Okay, yeah, and so there's a, a common concept called normal means that sounds kind of relevant to what you're discussing, which is, well, the most logical thing is just to assume, like, what's the most normal way that this would happen? But, like, by default, if we decided what we want to do the universal basic income, how would it naturally occur? Well, it's probably not going to happen via a constitutional convention, where we, like, use that arcane part of the Constitution no one ever uses to, like, call all the, like, legislatures together and, like, have a new amendment um, to get the universal basic income passed more likely it's going to be a bill from Congress. And so you say, well, the normal way to assume would be Congress is just going to debate about this bill and pass it. Um, something to that effect. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. Um, but this seems pretty relevant in terms of like, exactly what the negative uh, has in terms of political disadvantages. Because the app is saying, I'm not saying any particular statement about like this current Congress at this present time should pass the bill. Then your argument that says this current Congress at the present time is focusing on some other bill that's more important and we shouldn't derail that is going to become less relevant. So if you're defending a politics disadvantage, what you need to say is that conception is a good one. Why is it good to assume that? Well, usually the argument is debate, especially debates about the United States, are importantly focused on politics. And so it's an important uh, part of that debate to understand the political process, not just the end result. And so someone wanting to go for a politics disadvantage is going to say, it's important to consider not just the end results, whether the UBI would be bad once it happened, but also the harms in terms of what would happen if we tried to pass it. Why might it be negative um, just by virtue of trading off with other bills? Because all of politics is about you know, trading off one thing for another, making concessions, and so on. And so if you're trying to defend that, you should say, we should you know, imagine passing that bill and the whole process of debating it back and forth and something like that. And we should consider the relevant political ramifications. So you'd have to be able to defend that. Because affirmatives might reject you know, that in you know, a number of ways. Uh, a lot of the ones you hear, the would say, well, why can't we just pass both bills? Not really a logical opportunity cost. So they're getting just an argument to the effect of that. They might say, well, if the bill were to pass immediately, then there's, there's not that you know, period of debate in which you would lose the local capital. They might say something else like, well, maybe the natural or the normal way something would happen is not that we drop everything else and do that now. We wait till we resolve those other bills, like debate about tax cuts, decide whether to do them, and then we get around to debating a permanent bill, and it doesn't happen immediately, that's just the normal way things work, is if you decide you want to do something, you don't put away everything else, you just put it on your docket. And so there's a lot of, a lot of like, kind of various related ways the affirmative is going to say, this might not be the way things get done. The thing that you're saying where we just debate about the affirmative right before we pass the tax cuts, and then the affirmative undermines those tax cuts, or whatever the thing happens to be. And so if you're the negative, what you want to say is, yes, this is a good way to conceive of the affirmative. This would be a, an accurate conception of fiat. And then debate from there. So one way that uh, this is relevant is if you're introducing a politics disadvantage, it might be relevant to other areas as well. Um, questions about that? All right. Any questions about PIA at all that you think I haven't covered? All right, it's going well. Um, real briefly, um, eyes closed, put your hands in the air, just put a fist up. Five fingers up if you think you've completely followed everything so far. Zero if you're completely lost. Eyes closed, don't look around. Okay, that's good. Anybody have 
Um, a round in which you know fiat came up uh, went well, went poorly, or otherwise was confusing that you think needs to be covered. Alrighty. Um, we've covered all the core concepts, so I think we have about two more minutes left for Q and A. If you all have any questions. Go for it. I guess with a lot of critique, uh, alts, it might just be um, society should like reconfigure and re-engage with some idea or something. Is that a pretty common critique alt, right? I say usually just within the wrap. Yeah, so, something you know, not unlike that is probably a way that many critiques would explain the alternative. You know, like we have this different mindset towards whatever the thing that they're talking about is. I'd say yeah. Um, would that count as like an uh, agent counter plan because the agent is the United States government and the government cannot necessarily control what everyone thinks. If they explained it to that effect, you know, well, for one thing, I think a, a lot of critical criti alternatives are, you know, start out vague and the you know, art decides the, the most strategic version of explaining it. But yeah, to the extent that they were explaining it, it's just like, yes, I fiat that everybody changes their minds on this given issue. Then that would sound like not just an agent counter plan, but a particularly cheating one. Because, like, obviously the United States federal government doesn't have the ability to just, like, snap their fingers and make everyone change their minds. Um, so yeah, I'd say if they're explaining the, the alternative like that, it sounds like a, a particularly abusive agent counterplan. Another common one, the state's counterplan, uh, you know, is a, another one of those ones where like obviously it has never been the case and never will be the case that all 50 state governments just like simultaneously drop everything and pass identical bills that just happen to look exactly like a bill that the federal government was considering. Um, so the state's counterplan, as often debated, is usually a particularly egregious example of, of fiat. The federal government is never going to have to be like, hmm, well, we could pass the universal basic income, or we just have like all 50 states simultaneously do this. Usually that doesn't happen. That doesn't mean that the federal versus state government interaction is not a relevant portion of the debate, or that people aren't going to read that argument. Um, people are going to read that argument, should be ready for that argument. Um, state's counterpoint is really common on most domestic issue topics, uh, especially in policy debate, but also now so more so in LD. Um, but uh, more realistically, how do the federal government and the state government interact? The federal government might do something else. Maybe they do something like you know provide or you know, threaten to rescind block grants to states, you know like reduce federal funding if the states don't comply with something. Kind of like that bribing the lifeguard example. And so maybe the federal government thinks we shouldn't do it, states should do it. That doesn't mean states automatically do it, but it means we should do something to incentivize the states. Or we should back off and hope that states are doing it. Or maybe they just think the states are likely to do it now. You know, maybe the federal government is happy that states are already legalizing marijuana, and so they decide not to do anything about it. Um, that's probably insufficient because like, the federal laws against marijuana are also relevant and would need to be removed for that to be fully legal. Um, but point being, there's many ways the federal government and state governments can interact other than just like assume federal government does it or assume state governments do it, there's often ways in which the federal government might influence the states back and forth. And so that's another thing to consider that would also be relevant to federal state interaction. Other questions? I've got a hand up to this. Nothing? It's too early in the morning. I do have one more. Yeah, I go guess. for it. So, I found this one dude who's like an expert on uh, current welfare programs or whatever, and he says that a UBI uh, would require a left right coalition, and right support for the UBI is contingent on an approach that would increase poverty. Okay. Could I like dispute the fiat that way? Uh, so, how would you use that argument? So, I would say that. Uh, your solvency just isn't going to happen because you wouldn't be able to get the funding or the Republicans would like cut all of these other programs or whatever to get the UBI. I would say probably the second one sounds like the more strategic version than the first one. You know, if the argument was the UBI is just not going to happen because we're not going to fund it, that sounds like the sort of thing that's running into, well, obviously the app is going to say, well, I get to say, well, we should actually fund the thing. We can't pass a bill that says give everyone $10,000 and then not do it because we don't have the money. Um, so the first part, I think, is the one where you have more of an issue with the app saying, yeah, but we should do that. The second one sounds like it might be more relevant, especially if the app hasn't specified exactly like where the money comes from or what. And so maybe you say you know, the most normal means, the most natural way the app would happen is obviously we'd have to cut something. And given that the Republicans are the ones you'd have to get on board, uh, as opposed to the Democrats, you'd probably uh, have the Republicans having a lot of sway in what gets cut. And then maybe they cut something else that's more important. And so that would be a reason to think that you know, we lose whatever that other important thing is. 
right. Yes. Yes, good question. Other questions? All right, well, we can cut it here then. Thank you.